Morning, church. How are we doing? Can we clap up for Jarrett really quickly? He's been killing the announcements. He's been killing it. I love uh, Pastor Daryl, Pastor Vincent, and Sam. I love them. <laughs> I think there was a feud in the children's church. I think one of the students was like, his name is Pastor Sam. And the other girl was like, he's just Sam. He's not a pastor. So I love being what I am here. It's, uh, it's such a blessing to get to serve Youth ministry and the young adults, which, yeah, youth ministry, uh, if you're between 5th to 12th grade, we have our annual pumpkin carving on Wednesday for youth group. Um, and then young adults, we meet every Thursday. So if you're between the ages of, I think we said 23 to 35, um, every Thursday from 6 or 8, we hang out in this back room and just kick it and talk about the Lord. We're going through this really cool book called Knowing God Corporately as a small as small groups. So we're going through that. But, um, yeah, I'm just, uh, just want to start this message just... Um, expressing my gratitude for just this church. I, um, y'all could be anywhere on a Sunday. Like Sunday is such a, yeah, just a day of like cultural rest where people just kick it and watch football. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit prompted y'all to wake up and come to church. And I just know that anytime, anytime you enter into the presence of God, things happen. And so I'm not sure where you guys are at on your faith journey, but you just being here um, is doing something that you might not be able to see, but God sees it really clearly. So um, thank you all for being here, and I'm just super excited to be able to, to share and spend some time with you all this morning. So um, I also want to take a moment. My dad's not here. Um, him and my mom are coming back from Indiana. Benjamin had a game yesterday, and they won, so I'm no longer preaching from pain, which I'm very excited about. Very happy today. It's a happy Sunday. Um, but I've just been overwhelmed. Yeah, I've just been overwhelmed with gratitude just for my dad recently. Um, just seeing him lead has been so cool. Um, I went to you know college and played football and then came back in like 2020-ish. And I've just been able to see that man love this church, but also lead this church very well. And it's, it's hard, you know, it's really hard. And so I'm just so great for him and just the vision that he's imparted on this church as we move into this new season. And I'm just stoked to have him as my dad. And he's just been doing such an amazing job, even starting this new series. Um, this year, the, the series is worship, but we've kind of settled in this emphasis on praise over the last two weeks. And so he's done a really, really great job of defining what praise is and how praise is going to be um, reflected at VGC. And so today I'm going to spin it a bit and I'm going to talk about the why, the why behind praise. Um, I believe whether we look at our personal lives, um, if we look at scripture, there are so many reasons as to why we should praise God. I think we talk about our prayer life a lot, but I think we should also focus on our praise life. And I think that a big reason why sometimes our praise lives might not look the way we want them to look all the time is because sometimes we forget as to why we should worship the Lord, like what are those reasons? And so today we're going to spend some time discovering through scripture reasons as to why we should praise God. What should be our motivation? So the title of today's message is, you can write this down if you take note. The title of today's message is Praise, Discovering Our Praise. Discovering Our Praise. So we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. I'll read from the ESV. My dad mentioned this verse, this specific passage last week in his message, and I just wanted to hone in on it because it was just, it's one of my favorites. There's just so much truth. So we're going to essentially look at what Peter says about praise And we're going to corporately this morning discover our praise and figure out why we should praise God in the first place. So let's uh, let's open up the Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 7. I'll be in the ESV. I'll read it and then we'll pray. And then we'll, uh, we'll just spend some time praising God this morning. Amen? Awesome. So it says this. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray, church. Father, these moments are about you. From the worship to the exhortations to the transition to 
the messages to the way in which we carry on about um, just this Sunday. It's all about you. It's always been about you, God. So I just pray sincerely that at this moment, the words that I speak, the words that come out of my mouth are not my own, but yours alone, God. We as people, we are desperate for just a fresh experience with you, a fresh touch. So God, allow us to experience that this morning. Fill this space with your Holy Spirit. Do what only you can do. Teach us, reveal to us, and show us why we should praise you, Lord God. You are so good, and we pray that above all else, this time does nothing but glorify you. That is all we want, is to make your name great. So God, we pray that this moment, this message, this time we're spending together, is an adequate offering of praise this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, praise, praise, praise. So yeah, this is going to be a message that I'm excited about just because I'm just going to spend the next 30 minutes just geeking out about how good God is, and it's always fun getting to just praise God in front of, in front of people. So um, yeah, so my dad defined what praise was, right? It's to express approval, appreciation, and admiration for something, right? When I think of praise, I also think of this concept of like, making much of something, right? Like when you make much of something, you're kind of making it a pretty big deal. Um, means to attach great importance or significance to something, um, to celebrate it more than usual. Like my little brother, he got an interception yesterday and like that's all I'm thinking about. I was really making much of that. I was celebrating it, right? So the idea of making much of something, when we praise something, when we make much of something, we are stating that in that moment, whatever that thing is, it's extremely important, it's significant, and it's worthy of our celebration, right? So the idea of praise, it's to, to make it a big deal, right? To focus on it, to think about it often, and celebrate it more than usual, right? And I think this is the perfect example that we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3. It's just the first sentence of that verse, but Peter starts off in this letter. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Other translations literally say, praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he makes it a point to start this letter, right? And so the Apostle Peter, he starts this passage by giving extensive praise to God. He's making much of him. He's making sure that whoever's reading this scripture knows that in this moment, the most important, significant thing is God, and he's worthy of being celebrated. Does that make sense, right? He's starting it off, he's setting the tone, he's saying, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing he says, right? So my first question as we dive into this is, when we read this, do we see ourselves in Peter's proclamation? Is our praise life, like I said, does it resemble that of Peter? When we go throughout our days, do we find ourselves spontaneously expressing praise like this? Like, do we drive around the street just saying, praise be to God, right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if not, that's okay, because I think that um, we're going to get there. I think this is what God desires the posture to be in our church. Just people who unprovoked are just like, man, praise God. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we're going to spend some time just like diving into this scripture and looking at um, yeah, just the reasons behind why Peter says this, right? We're going to discover the reasoning and discover our praise essentially and see how it shapes our perspective. So 1 Peter um, chapter 1, verses 3 continued. It says this, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is, God is wild. But um, I want to hone in on this concept of, um, of being born again. I think we say this, like, I'm a born again believer, I'm a born again this, right? And um, in a famous verse, John chapter 3, verses 3, Jesus is talking to a Pharisee named Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is asking a whole bunch of, like, spiritual jargon and things like that. And Jesus drops the mic, and he says, listen, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I want to just quick little um, recap, but we all know this. It's not, you know, a surprise, but ever since Adam and Eve, every person who ever existed was born into sin. 
And I think that is the sole reason as to why the world we live in is the way it is, right? A lot of people ask me, like, oh, Sam, like, what do you think of the world? And I'm just like, y'all, we live in a sinful world. Like, we live in a world that's full of sin because we were born into sin, right? We live in a world, in my opinion, that must be born again, right? We live in a world that, like, needs new hearts that will produce new lives, right? Like, we need, you, like, we all need to be born again, right? And I think when we hear this phrase, like, you need to be born again, right? When we hear people say, you need this, I think the first knee-jerk reaction is, okay, cool, like, how can I achieve it? How can I earn it, right? How can I buy this, right? If it's important, I need it, and I need it now, right? But this verse in First Peter uh, chapter 1, verses um, 3 this verse clearly states that this thing, this concept of being born again, this is something that God causes. This is according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Which means, honestly, y'all, that there is like nothing that we could ever do, nothing that we can do to be born again. It is caused by God. That if you're someone in this room and you identify as a believer, as someone who's born again, understand it wasn't because of anything that you did. It's been so cool seeing um, my buddy Derek. Derek started coming to the church a little bit ago and got baptized. And it's just been so cool seeing him just getting plugged in and things. And I'm just so encouraged because it's like, Derek didn't do that. It's God. Like I, I get to watch this dude come to young adults and hang out and be here. And I get to see him growing because of God. And understand, y'all, like everything, like every spiritual thing that we may achieve or do, it's because of God, not us, right? Like even like I'm so, I get so overwhelmed realizing that even, even my ability to even love God is caused by God. Like I couldn't even say the words that I say unless it was caused by God, So I want us to understand reason number one as to why we should praise God is because God causes for us what we could never cause for ourselves. God causes for us what we could never cause for ourselves. And I think even like on a more practical level, um, just think about all of the overlooked and underrated aspects of your life that God causes to happen on a daily basis. Like, how many amazing things does God do just every single day that we know for a fact we couldn't do it ourselves, right? Like, even getting us all in this room safely is a miracle, right? The fact that we woke up, like, it's a miracle, right? Everything that we have, to be honest, has been caused by God. And I, I, I was thinking about this story, but um, I, I'm, I'm a big, I love, like, gatherings and bringing people together and, you know, parties and things like that and surprises. And um, two years ago, my little sister Grace she was going away to PA school. And so me and my big sister, Faith, we just orchestrated this big, elaborate, like, surprise party for her. It was the coolest thing ever. Like, I love surprise parties. But um, we spent, like, a cool two weeks just, like, setting it up. So we were like, okay, cool. Let's make sure these friends are here at this time. We got to DM them. We got to order this. We got to make sure this is in play over here. All to eventually, hopefully, culminate into this big, like, surprise and reveal of, like, aha, ta-da. Um, and, like, me and Grace, me and Faith, we put in work. Like, we were working overtime to make sure that this thing was perfect for Grace. Like, we were like, this is our baby sister. She's so loved. She's so sweet. And before she leaves, we need to make sure that she knows how loved she is by us through the surprise. And so everyone pulls up to the house, and there's just, like, this, this like, millisecond of, like, anticipation where, like, we can hear Grace coming up into the, the garage. And, like, everyone's kind of like, okay, cool. Like, this is the moment. Like, Grace is going to see all of the work that we put in, right? And, like, she comes in. She freaks out. And she, like, it, for lack of better words, like, she begins praising us for all that we did for her. She's like, yo, like, I can't believe that you did this and this, and you got this person here and that person pulled up. And I really feel like this is exactly how God relates to us. I think every single day, God is, like, orchestrating and planning and, like, putting this here and placing this here, all in the hopes that his children will realize what he's done for us and praise him. If that makes sense, right? Like, I feel like every single day, God's like, okay, like, they're going to see it. Like, they're going to notice. And we're just like, hmm, you know? Like, it's like, oh, okay, God, that's cool. When he's been, like, actively, like, like pulling the strings, I think it's the coolest thing, but I really think that this is how God is with us. And so I want us to understand that when we realize that God causes for us what we can never cause for ourselves, it should bring forth so much praise in our hearts. 
when we realize that he's, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, when we realize, like, really, that he does things for us, y'all, that we could never do for ourselves. Like, we are alive. We are breathing. We don't do that. Like, when I sleep, I don't pay attention to, like, keep myself alive. Like, God does that, right? I don't. I just knock out. When we realize that God causes for us what we could never cause, like, look at your life. Look at everything he's done that you know that had to have been God, right? And these things should really just, like, bring forth so much praise in our hearts. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, and before we go on, I think um, what makes that point even more special, um, according to Scripture, is that God does all of this in spite of us. This verse, it says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, right? Understand that this causational relationship where God causes good to happen in our lives, it's a product primarily of his mercy. And like, honestly, I don't even think that I really wrestle with the the concept of mercy as much as I should, but it's pretty wild when you realize that um, because of our sin, because of our daily mishaps and mess ups and imperfections. Yeah, uh uh-oh. Uh-oh, exactly. A hundred percent. I love God. Causing things to happen. Because of our sin, our imperfections, we're deserving of punishment. Like we're deserving of a sentence, right? Because we have sinned, because we've sinned against a holy God, we're deserving of one fate and one fate only, and that fate is death, right? This verse says, because of his great mercy, that punishment is not only withheld, but we're also given good. Like mercy should just stop at being withheld, but God says, I'm not only going to withhold it, I'm going to give you good. Like that is mercy, Everything that we have, every good thing, every blessing, it's caused by God, but it's also caused because of his mercy as well. Like if we can just sit and just realize how much mercy God has given us in our lives, we'd be, like we'd be on the ground crying and weeping, right? I want to revisit reason number one as to why we should praise God. It's because God causes for us what we can never cause for ourselves because of his great mercy. God causes for us what we can never cause for ourselves because because of his great mercy. And in my opinion, church, that should be a reason for a lot of praise. Amen? Okay. All right, let's keep going. Um, I've run out of time. My goodness. Wish we could do this like all day. Um, I'll just like take turns preaching. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. It says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it's caused to be born again to a living hope. But he says in verse 4 to 5, we've also been called to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Do that one more time. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Um, yeah, and li- life has been like just heavy. You know, life is, life is interesting to say the least. Um, it's a blessing, but it's definitely something that causes you to just think deeply about it. But I've been reflecting on just, uh, even this last week as I've been preparing for this message, just on um, just humanity and just asking myself the question, man, why do we even like with my little brother, like just like being so obsessed with like, they gotta make the playoff and this, and you know, this ranked team, just like asking myself the question, like why do we praise, because we're talking about praise, right? Like why do we praise certain people, places, and things, right? Like why do we praise and like desire certain experiences and luxuries? Why do we cling and attach ourselves so tightly to the things of this world? But also like why do we feel so sad and disheartened and frustrated when life doesn't go as like well as we planned, right? Like, why do we just like lose it when it's like, ah. And I think um, this is just a thought, I probably share this with someone I'm always talking, but um, I think 
I think somewhere, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of this like all the time, but I think somewhere, somehow, we talk about like praising, right? And what's worthy of our praise, like Jared said. I think somewhere and somehow we've tricked ourselves into believing that this life is the prize. I think we've tricked ourselves into believing that this life is like the ultimate purpose. That this life is as good as it will ever get. That this life right here is the ultimate prize. And to be honest, if it is, then I understand and I see why we're going to be struggling and striving and trying to hold on so tightly to things in this world. But if I can do one thing, even for the students who are in here, if I can save anyone just some time and some energy this morning, I need us to understand one thing, and that thing is that this life, y'all, is not the prize. That this existence, like this reality, like it is not the prize. Like, it is not the ultimate purpose, not the ultimate goal. Like, this life in itself, in and of itself, is not the prize. That achievement, not the prize. Like, that status, not the prize. That, like, that job, that comfort, not the prize. And, like, this sucks for me to even say this because I hate it because I'm a hopeless romantic. But, like, marriage, relationship, not the prize. And I'm not saying these things are bad at all. I'm just saying that these things should not be the things that primarily occupy our praise. Because they're fading, right? We all know like how it feels to like receive that thing that you've been just like longing for and you realize it's just like unfulfilling, right? Like we all know how that feels, right? Like they're fading. Like that, uh, that old Drake song, like they're here today and gone tomorrow. I kind of went over someone's head. The millennials, they know that. The kids might be too young for that. Great song. But yeah, like, they're fading. This life is not the prize, but the good news is that this verse says that we are born again also to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for us by God's power. So contrary to the world that we live in, God has an inheritance for all of us that cannot perish, that cannot spoil, and will not fade away. And the best thing is that it has your name written on it. That God has a prize that is perfect, that supersedes anything that we could experience on this earth, and it has your name on it. Like every single person in here, God has a prize, an inheritance, a life, a reality that is so perfect, and he wants you to have it. And I think that is like my goal. That is like what I want most for us, is for us to just like understand that the prize is Jesus. The prize is what Jesus died for. The prize is what God, like that, that is the prize. Like I know I talk about tennis and all these things, but it's like, Talk to me about how I can get that prize. Talk to me about Jesus. Like, I, like if, out of all the things that we can be consumed with as a people, this is what we should be consumed with. This is the prize. And so my prayer is that we do not slip into the tragic habit of praising the little that we think this life has to offer while neglecting what God has already offered us. Reason number two as to why we should praise God is because God has a prize waiting for us. That God has a reality, a relationship, an existence that is so perfect, that is imperishable, that is unfading, and it has your name on it. I don't know about you guys, when I think of the fact that God is keeping a prize for me, that he is a prize with my name on it, an inheritance that is mine, that makes me want to praise God. Understand, we should praise God because God has a prize waiting for us that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. And as I run out of time and as we land um, this way in the next like 10-ish minutes, um, 
in the beginning of this message, I mentioned that I think a big reason why our praise lives might not look the way that we want them to look all the time um, is because we can tend to forget all that God has done for us. And I know, speaking from experience, um, sometimes the easiest times to forget all that God has done for me has been in difficult seasons, right? Like, when difficult seasons hit, it's super easy to forget all that God has, all that God has done before, if that makes sense. And so I think this is a perfect time to talk about the context of this passage, why Peter is even writing this in the first place and who he's writing to. Um, because understand, in this passage, 1 Peter um, chapter 1, just the entire 1 Peter, if you read kind of like the notes and look into the context, Peter, yes, he's writing to Christians, but he's specifically writing to Christians who are experiencing a really, really difficult season. Um, he's speaking to the Christians who were a part of like the Asian dispersion. And so they were going through a lot. They were being you know, persecuted by the, for the faith, but also they were you know, separated from one another. And I think this makes this passage even more interesting because um, these Christians probably like, sent a distress call to Peter. Like, yo, like, we're getting torn up over here. Like, we're dispersed. And the first thing Peter sends back is, praise God. It's crazy. The first thing he types back is, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think he does this for a reason. Because I think he's trying to point out that there is never an excuse to not praise God. And that if praise is deterred by difficult seasons and circumstances then is it really praise? And so I want to take a moment to um, specifically speak to, I just feel it on my heart, to speak to, because we can say these things like, you know, praise God, praise God, just, you know, regurgitate it like the Christians that we are, and also like completely, um, just completely like ignore the reality that life is hard that we have difficult seasons. So I want to speak to some people this morning who might be in the room who you might be in a difficult season that's making it really, really hard to praise God consistently, right? You're in a season where it's like, man, the the bad right now really does outweigh the good. And I want to make sure we just like speak to that. And I believe that this next point and as we close, this next verse that Peter says is going to, um, is definitely going to tend to that, which would be cool. So First Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. He says this to the Christians who are dispersed. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that one more time so we get it. It says, in this you rejoice, you have joy, you praise God. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found a result in praise and glory and honor the revelation of Jesus Christ. A big question I talk to a lot of people about is like, you know, what is... What is God's will for our lives? Right, we always talk about just like the will of God. Like we just want to do what God you know, wants us to do and the will of God and things like that. And we try to make it like this big complicated thing of just like, okay, like the will of God is this and he needs to tell me this on a mountaintop and I need to do this. When in reality, y'all, like in 1 Thessalonians, it says that God's will for our lives is our sanctification. Simple as that. God's will for our lives is our sanctification. And that big word, it just pretty much means becoming more like Jesus, casting off the old and putting on the new, right? Being sanctified means becoming more like Jesus in faith and obedience, right? And so like I said, like sanctification is accessed through faith, which then produces obedience, right? Like the more faith we have, the more we obey and the more we're resembling Jesus, right? And I want us to understand like, if faith is such an important part in us experiencing and achieving the will of God for our lives, like trials like play a part in that. Because understand without trials, there'd be no way to tell like how genuine our faith really is. Like without difficult season, there would be no way to tell if our faith is strong and genuine, right? So the more our faith increases through trials, 
so does our obedience. The more our obedience grows, the more we really do begin to resemble and embody the person of Jesus, and we are in this process of sanctification, right? Like the will of God. And the blessing with all of this that I think is like such a reason to praise God is that God really doesn't waste our trials. He uses them. Like God doesn't just allow trials to hit us and then boom, like God really, really uses our trials and he uses them to make us more like his son, Jesus. I think what, um, what you may have thought to be just a really, really bad break and a bad season God was using it to make you more like his son. What you may have considered to be just a tragedy and a loss, God used that to make you more like Jesus. What you thought to be a heartbreak, God was increasing your faith to make you more like Jesus. And I'm not saying he caused it, right? We're not going to get into that. That's a, that's a different conversation for another day. I can't do it today. But the one thing I will say is that he uses everything. He uses everything to make sure that we are conforming more to the image of Christ every single day. And I just, I want to take a moment, like as we wrap, because I'm running out of time. Um, I'm sad she's not in here. My big sister, Faith, she's back with the kids. Um, I'd like to say that my parents are like the, uh, the rock and the glue that keeps our family together. But to be honest, it's my older sister, Faith. Um, She's the oldest of five siblings, and so, you know, she was the one. She was like the test subject, right? She had to kind of go through it all. And um, what I've realized, watching her, at, you know, her being 28 and I'm 26, and just watching her life, and I think, like, London can attest to this as well as she just sees Faith grow, but um, Faith empties herself for our family, like, she's the best big sister ever. And I feel bad because, like, I'm sometimes mean to her as, like, her little brother. But um, my big sister does so much for our family. Like, she cares so deeply about us. And, like, what we thought was just, like, the annoying big sister was just her trying to make sure that we were taken care of all the time. And she'll be following me tell, saying this. And, like, she's great. But um, my big sister, Faith, she, she's going through an interesting season. Like, I'm, I'm watching her go through a difficult season. Like, both of our little sisters got engaged, and Faith was, like, the main one to, like, orchestrate all of it. Like, she's holding it down. But, like, she's in a really difficult season right now, and she's fine. Like, she's doing great. But every single morning, I wake up, and I get to watch my sister put on humility, exercise her faith, because her name is Faith, and I get to see her, like, trust God deeply in this difficult season, and so although I'm seeing her in a difficult season, I'm also seeing her become more like Jesus. And I was talking to her, and I was like, Faith, I was like, yeah. and I told her that. And she was like, thanks, Sam, I appreciate it. But like, I, I'm, I'm watching my sister through a difficult season, through her faith being stretched, looking more and more like Christ every single day. And I think the fact that God will even purpose difficult seasons to make us more like his son is the craziest thing ever. That he will take what we hate and turn it into what we need, if that makes sense. And so my last point as to why we should praise God. God uses trials and difficult seasons to increase our faith and make us more like Jesus. That he even cares about the bad things and he cares about purposing those things to make us more like his son. So in recap, I wrote down three reasons today. First reason as, as to why we should praise God is because God causes for us what we could never cause for ourselves because of his great mercy. Second is God has a prize waiting for us. And third is that in his goodness, he even will use trials and difficulties to increase our faith and make us more like his son. If I can leave us with one thing, I think we need to understand that everything that God does for us is good, even trials. And consistent goodness from God must draw out consistent praise from us. Amen? And if there's one person who, um, 
consistently praised God just really, really well. Who praised God through the trials, through the difficulties. There's one person who knew what it meant to make much of God and to make him the most important thing ever. It was Jesus. Jesus is the perfect example of what it looks like to praise God until the end. And the way in which we can learn a proper praise, y'all, is by one, studying the life of Jesus, but also entering into a relationship with Jesus as well. Like, I just, I believe that um, a people who praise God well are people who don't forget about God. And I just want to encourage us this morning, y'all, God has done so many things for us. There are so many reasons as to why we should praise God. And I just believe that this is going to be a church that not just prays, but we're going to be a church that praises because we remember all that God has done for us. So as we close, um, I just want to pray. I want to pray that over just this house. I want to pray that, pray that over our lives because I don't, God is the only thing that we should be consumed with. God is the only thing that we should be praising. Like I said, it's okay to have aspirations and dreams and things like that, but if praising God is not our number one focus, then we've got to get into this word and realize that he should be the number one focus. So I just want to pray for us really quickly and just take a moment to praise God to, like Jared said, to place him back on our heart as the most important thing, to place him as the prize, because Y'all, we're always going to praise whatever we consider to be the prize, right? And this morning, I want us to leave knowing that God is the prize, that he is our focus, that he is the reason we're here. So therefore, he should occupy every bit of our praise. So let's all just bow our heads really quickly. Lord, we just thank you so much for this time. We thank you for moments like this where you remind us how much you've done for us. We thank you that you cause for us what we couldn't cause for ourselves according to your mercy. We are in awe that you have a prize for us that will not fade. And we are in awe of the fact that you will even use trials and difficult seasons to make us more like your son. God, what could be better than becoming more like Jesus? God, there's no accolade There's no achievement. There's no status, God, that could be more valuable than becoming more like your son. You sent him to die for us. You sent him to live the perfect life we could never live. He died the death that we should have died so we can experience relationship with him and fellowship with you as well, God. So if you're someone in this room, and you're just like, man, I just... I want to know this Jesus person that people rave about. I want to stop praising these false prizes. I want to discover reasons as to why I should praise God. Can you just slip up your hand so I can pray for you this morning? Amen. I see that hand. Amen. Amen. Well, Lord, you see these hands. You know, at the most basic level, God, this is the response. And we praise you for a response to you. God, I pray that whatever weight is holding us back, whatever things that we are praising in our lives, God, that you will cast them aside and you will place them at the wayside and you will place yourself at the top of our hearts, Lord. Reveal to us all the reasons as to why we should praise you and allow us never to forget. We thank you for just who you are. We thank you for this church. And we just pray that we can leave this place changed. In Jesus' name, amen.